And I want to speak tonight on death. I'm not going to turn to Dr. Kubler-Ross tonight, or to Dr. Raymond Moody, or to Dr. Morris Rawlins, or to the newspapers, or to the television. I want to turn to the Bible. What does the Bible have to say about death that may help you prepare to live more fully, with greater satisfaction, with greater assurance, here and now, and help you to face that inevitable moment when you will have to face death and nobody goes through death with you from this world. That's one battle you fight all alone if you're outside of Christ. First, the Bible teaches that death is an enemy of man and God. Paul calls it an enemy. He says the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Now, death is not only the enemy of man, it's the enemy of God. Paul says that Christ must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Now, neither sin, nor pain, nor disease, nor death were part of God's original plan. God never meant that we would get sick. He never meant that we would have pain. He never meant that we would fight. He never meant that we would have hate or greed or lust. He never meant that there would be any death. When God created man, he put him in paradise, a perfect environment. And God gave to man a gift that he did not give to his other creatures. He gave the gift of the freedom of choice. He didn't create you a robot that he could push a button and you would obey him. The mighty God of heaven created you in his image with the will of your own. And God said, I'm going to test man. And he told man. He said, if you will love me and obey me and work with me, we will build a beautiful world together. But if you reject me, rebel against me, break my laws, you are going to suffer and you're going to die. So man had that choice. What did he do? To the shock of the whole universe, to the shock of all the angels and archangels and principalities and powers, man broke God's moral law, rebelled against God, sinned against God. And as a result, God kept his word God is not a liar. Man began to suffer. Hate came into the world. Greed came. Lust came. And death came. As a result of man's sin. And God drove man out of the Garden of Eden, out of paradise, and put an angel with a flaming sword at the entrance so that man could not get back in and eat of the tree of life and live forever in his sins. In one sense, death is a great blessing to the human race. Suppose man had eaten of the tree of life and lived forever in his sins, this earth would have already been hell. Sometimes you feel like it's close to it already. It is appointed unto man to die, and after that the judgment, the Scripture says. But what happened? The moment that man sinned, the moment he broke God's law, he came under the sentence of death, but God set about a fantastic program to redeem man and to save man. God could not go against his nature. God is a holy God. He's a righteous God. God could not come along to man and say, Adam and Eve, you just made a little mistake. I'll forgive you that this time. To try not to do it again. God's word was at stake. God had to keep his word. He said, you will suffer and you will die if you break my law. And so God's word was kept. God is a just God. And man began to suffer and man began to die. And every generation dies because we are all sinners. You see, Adam and Eve were the first sinners, but they transmitted the disease, and it is a disease, to Cain and Abel. 
They were sinners. They transmitted it to theirs offspring and on down to you and me and every one of us and David, the great king of Israel said, in sin did my mother conceive me. I was born in sin. I was shapen in iniquity. And then when I reach the age of maybe seven, eight, nine, ten, the age of accountability, when I know the difference between right and wrong, I choose to be a sinner. I tell a lie. I have bad thoughts about my parents. I become a sinner by choice. And then as I get old, I become a sinner by practice. I practice sin. I live in sin. And every man since Adam has been the same. Born in sin. Chooses to sin. Practices sin. And the sentence of death hanging over all of us. Now, Newsweek quotes a famous Swiss psychiatrist, Dr. Kubler-Ross, as saying, I have more than enough evidence of the afterlife. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Now, the Bible teaches that death has already been defeated. How was death defeated? By God's plan of redemption. God's plan of redemption was that you're on death row. You deserve judgment. You deserve to be lost. You deserve hell. You deserve to die. But someone in the universe was qualified to take your place. Only one. And that person was the son of the living God. He stepped forward and he said, I'll go to the planet Earth. And I will take their suffering and their death and their hell. And Jesus said, to this end was I born. We think of Jesus Christ as a great moral teacher, and he was. And we think of him as a great social activist, and he was. But his primary purpose for coming was to die. And when he died on that cross and shed his blood, something mysterious happened. God took your sins, your sins, your death, your hell, and laid it on Christ. And when he died, he said, it's finished. The plan of salvation that was conceived in the great mind of God finished because God said, in spite of their sins, in spite of their rebellion, I love them. And he loves you tonight. Whatever your sins have been. You see, the Bible teaches there are three kinds of death. There's physical death. You can go out to a cemetery and you see the evidence of physical death. Go to a hospital where many people are dying. You see evidences of death. But there's spiritual death. That means that you can be alive right now physically, but your heart is dead toward God. You can go to church on Sunday morning and walk down the aisle and sit in the church. And when the collection is passed, put in your dollar. And everybody says you're a fine person, but down inside, you know that your heart, your spirit, your soul is dead toward God. There's no fellowship with God. There's a social reaction that you have in the church service and you enjoy the music and some of you enjoy the preaching. But down deep inside, you know it's not real. It's sort of play acting. There hasn't been that real personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Now that's spiritual death. And there are millions of people that are spiritually dead. They go through all the forms of religion and think that's enough. But that's not enough. Now, the Bible talks about the second death or eternal death. That death I'll talk about in a moment. That is when you die, your spirit goes out into eternity and is lost from God. Separated from God. And that is called by Jesus, hell. Now, when a person is a Christian, of course, it's, or when a person knows Jesus Christ, or when a person experiences God, 
It's totally different. The disc jockeys have been reviving an old song this year called, And When I Die, I Pray There Ain't No Hell. And you remember Michelangelo's Last Judgment is considered by many to be man's greatest work of art. And Judgment Day has gone out of style until recently, until recently in the art world. Anthony Urquhart, one of the most distinguished painters and sculptors in the world, 20 years ago when he graduated from New York Art School, Judgment and Hell were the last themes to occupy his mind. But now, in his world-famous great vine box on display at New York University Fine Arts Gallery, he displays a coffin with oddly shaped doors revealing a sobering allegory of death and damnation. Temple One, for example, is the funeral gray opening up a display, a jagged black crystalline hell. And this is why death is so solemn and so terrible, whether you're conscious of it or not, because you see the Bible says you immediately await judgment. There are three words in the Bible used to describe hell. One is fire. For our God is a consuming fire. Now the scripture uses the word fire symbolically many times. It says your tongue is set on fire of hell. That doesn't mean it's literal combustion. Jesus used the symbol over and over. I think it's a thirst for God in eternity that will never be quenched. A fire that can never be put out. That would be the hell of hell to never know God. The second word that Jesus used, these all three words that Jesus used, by the way, is darkness. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 5, God is light. But the Bible also says, Jesus said, but the children of the kingdom shall be cast into outer darkness. Hell will be a place separated from God and it'll be dark and it'll be lonely. You won't be there with a lot of other people. You'll be all alone in darkness. And then the third word that Jesus used was death. The Bible says God is life. And it says, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, the second death. God doesn't take any delight in that. He didn't create hell for us. The Bible says he created hell for the devil and his angels. But if you choose, if you choose, and you have that right, if you choose, that's where you'll end up. And that's very serious, and that's why death is so sobering, and that's why death is so real, and that's why you must take it seriously. Because you're talking about eternity, forever. You have a choice. God gave you a will. You have the same choice that Adam and Eve had in the garden. 